Uh, hello, everybody. Good evening and welcome to Artist Space Books and Talks. Thank you for your patience and thank you all for coming on such a, a nasty evening. Um, so I'm really happy to um, be here tonight to present uh, the final evening program as part of We Not I, a four-day convening bringing together women artists, writers, curators and thinkers identifying with feminist practices. Organized by artist Melissa Gordon and writer Marina Vishmit, this project has centered on daily meetings taking place here at Artist Space Talk Books and Talks, each of which has focused on particular topics uh, that have then fed into the evening events. So I'm going to hand over um, very briefly, very shortly, to Melissa, who's going to give a bit more background to the, to the We Not I project, how it's evolved here and, and how it came into being in the first place. Um, and then she's going to hand over to Marina, who's going to moderate tonight's discussion and introduce that further. Um, but I'd just like to say, on behalf of Artispace, we're really pleased and excited to welcome tonight's contributors, Sylvia Federici, Melanie Gilligan, Sean Smith-Cruz, and Lisa, Lisa Soskolny. Um, so I also wanted just to give a little um, thank you at the beginning of this evening to Thea Westright Wagner and Ethan Wagner, who supported the We Not I program and also the Friends of Artist Space who support all our programs and exhibitions at Artist Space. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Melissa. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, I'm just gonna, this is the final night, so I'm gonna just give a bit of a history of the whole project because tonight's actually really the final event of this kind of actual I think about five year project that I've been involved with with Marina. So it's nice to kind of tell the story and then end with um, one of the biggest inspirations, Sylvia Federici, <laughs> here to talk about it. So in 2010, um, just to give a background to this whole project, um, in 2010, I organized a series of women artist meetings entitled A Conversation to Know If There's a Conversation to Be Had. And the first one we held at Dexter Sinister. Um, we also held one at the Kunstverein in Amsterdam. Um, and another at Raven Row in London over the course of about a year. And the idea we really was to invite women artists to talk about is there actually a conversation to be had amongst each other as, as women. And in the end, each meeting, there was a lot to talk about. I mean, they ended up being kind of eight hour plus long conversations. Um, that brought up a lot of really interesting material. So, um, and one of the um, first and foremost um, things that came up was this question of labor and women's labor what it means to be um, a kind of woman um, that is has a lot of kind of invisible labor um, as an artist but also as a as a worker so um, the from that, um, Marina and I edited a magazine together entitled Simply Labor, <laughs> um, which kind of looked at um, this in a very oblique manner. And the idea being that we wanted to follow up from these meetings with a publication that addressed the concerns of women artists first and foremost, not necessarily directly as in an essay form, but allowing women um, um, to have the voice to talk about these these things through a publication. So we, um, another main thing that came up in a lot of the meetings was the question of self-presentation. Like, what does it mean? What face do you put to the world? So we, um, two years later, we spent about two years putting together um, a publication called Persona, which has uh, got a pink cover with a um, very regal looking woman on the front is out there. Um, again, I think trying to kind of give a space um, for a multitude of female voices um, to be talking about things that are important to contemporary artists at the moment. And I think that's really important for us that this is a space that um, is not necessarily focused on, a, like, I don't know, addressing feminism as a subject, but rather allowing it to develop, I think, I hope, um, with women's voices at the front of that. So we came to this project, We Not I, hoping the other main thing that came up in a lot of these artist meetings was the question of collectivity, working together, supporting each other's support structures. So we wanted We Not I to be, to kind of go back to the original structure of meetings to kind of hand back the power, like the editorial power structure to a group of people. So um, we did two um, events. The first series of events was held in London at Raven Row again, um, South London Gallery and Flat Time House, and there were over 40 women artists, writers, and thinkers involved in meetings and presentations um, over the course of six days. 
um, including a, a symposium, a public symposium, um, and a couple of evening events. And then we're concluding the whole project here at Artist Space, which we've been generously hosted and unbelievably supported by Richard and Harry. I mean, Richard's just been supporting this project like for a really long time and making it happen. Thank you so much um, for having it come to life. Um, and so anyway, these past four days have been really fantastic series of public talks. And I think even the public talks have been, um, I think, I don't know how to say, as productive as the kind of daytime um, meetings amongst people talking about specific subjects. So we've discussed the first day, we were focusing on the artist's voice, and we, um, in the evening, Angie Kiefer and Lynn Tillman um, gave talks on the second night um, and day. We were focused on thinking about authorship in an expanded field and had um, Ariana Raines, a fantastic poet, read. Um, also, she read um, an uh, uh, excerpt from Chris Krause's new book, and Meredith Sparks. Um, and last night, I think as people know, we had uh, Joan Jonas and um, Dara Birnbaum in conversation with um, Kathy Noble on the kind of, maybe it wasn't about legacy, we wanted it to be about legacy, but that's fine that it ended up expanding. So tonight's the final um, event, and I think we were hoping that all these um, subjects like authorship, val um, legacy, voice, and now value are really all overlapping um, concerns um, to do with contemporary f um, discourse around feminism and women as workers in the art world and other worlds as well. Um, so thank you for letting me do a, an expanded intro. Thank you very much for being here, and I'll hand. Can you do a yes. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, thanks, Richard, and Again, want to thank Artist Space for their unbelievable um, support and collaboration and friendliness. Um, so I guess the this event is kind of trying to bring out several dimensions of uh, we, not I, and articulate them explicitly, maybe in a in a more perhaps activist or political register. Not that the other days or sort of registers were not, but I think kind of bringing it into the um, space of maybe community organizing and questions around community and space and social reproduction and labor. So hence today's discussion was kind of more going into sort of systemic analysis of how subjectivities and gender and so forth are produced within the current capitalist social relations that we inhabit. Um, so I'll keep that quite short. Maybe more will come out. Um, obviously, more will come out in discussion amongst you guys and all of you. Um, and I should say it's not quite over because we'll make some publications. <laughs> yes. Um, we, not I, will ramify into other we's and other um, uh, existences. So I think I'll probably just go straight into introducing um, um, people here you see before you tonight, uh, who uh, is abs absolutely overwhelming that we managed to gather them all here tonight, um, despite, despite their busy, busy lives. Um, so I'll go kind of in order. Um, so first, I think Lisa Siskolny will speak. And uh, she is an artist and the core organizer of WAGE, which is working artists in the greater economy. And I think her talk will just give a context for how wages for housework, or the idea of both wages for and against housework, inspired a lot of the methodology and thinking um, for, for WAGE, and that continues to kind of change and um, be inflected by the, the different, the greater economy, but also wages, wages practice. Um, I'm not going to go into longer introductions because you should all have printed ones. But um, afterwards, um, Melanie Gilligan will speak and show a clip of her most recent work, The Common Sense. Melanie is an artist and a writer, and while the work that she's going to show a clip of is normally presented as an installation, so there's a spatial element to it, which we are uh, not going to experience now, but she's going to tie in 
or rather explicate a lot of the themes around collectivity, technology, and the transformation of our subjectivity by um, the way those forces have developed in the current capitalist moment. Um, and finally, our two final, although that's two and two, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, third, we have Sean Smith-Cruz, who um, I can't resist reading out the first sentence of her bio because it's so great, uh, is a separatist, zinester, archivist, writer, and Black Dyke participant of intentional community-specific collective space. And she's worked for a long time with the Lesbian Her Story Archives, amongst many other amazing projects which are listed. Uh, and she also uh, is a prof assistant professor at the Graduate Center at CUNY. I think there might be some other people from there here tonight. And uh, finally, we have uh, Silvia Federici, who is um, probably more or less known to most people here tonight. Certainly been like tremendous inspiration for me, for Melissa, and for m m most of the feminists I know and, non and other um, political people. She's a New York-based scholar, um, organizer, teacher, writer. Um, her book, Caliban and the Witch, which came out in the early 2000s, Caliban and the Witch, uh, Women, the Body, and Primitive Accumulation, has been extraordinarily um, influential also for the analysis of how um, the production of women, the production of gender, and the appropriation of women's bodies was globally um, was instrumental in the success or the evolution of uh, capitalism and continues to be so now, um, but also um, on the scale on the scale of racialization and dispossession um, worldwide. So, primitive, primitive accumulation um, was really put into into the context of. Uh, gender and the historical production of the body as as a commodity, as a gendered commodity in that book. Um, her more recent book, which is a collection collection of essays from uh, her years of activity, is Revolution at Point Zero. So um, I guess everyone will speak very briefly, just kind of to introduce themselves and their projects, um, their in, their engagements, their involvements, and then we'll put put everyone uh, into, into dialogue in a kind of expanded, almost immediately expanded panel, because I want all of us to be part of that conversation. So over to you, Lise. Thanks. Is this on? Can you guys hear me? Um, I actually I wrote a, a short text, so I'm going to read that. And I should just make one small correction, which is just to say that um, as extraordinary as Wages for Housework is, and is currently a huge inspiration to wage uh, it's actually, what's more extraordinary to me is that the methodology developed like in parallel without knowledge of it. And I think that's actually what's really interesting is that there are so many connections, but uh, they, they, they happened, I suppose, by chance in a certain way, or, or not by chance. Um, all right. Uh, by now, most of you are probably familiar with WAGE, but for those of you who aren't, who aren't WAGE stands for Working Artists in the Greater Economy. WAGE currently defines itself as an activist organization focused on regulating the payment of artist fees by nonprofit art institutions and establishing a sustainable labor relation between artists and the institutions that contract their labor. WAGE was born here in New York City in 2008 in direct response to the gross excesses of the commercial art market, which in 2007 alone had expanded by 55%. By then, it was clear that the torrents of profit that had flooded every dimension of our social relations were never going to trickle down far enough to provide any tangible economic benefit to the very people upon whose labor they were based. Many of these people were women. And while there wasn't and still isn't much of a sales market for artworks produced by women, the cultural capital of some of these women seemed to be quite efficiently producing economic value within and for the city's nonprofit cultural institutions themselves closely linked to the commercial market. And some of these women found that, despite their visibility, they were always broke and struggling and had no conceivable value in this new art world beyond that which they could potentially generate through the charm of, of performing their economic impoverishment as artists. Some of these women recognized a larger structural problem that was writing artists out of the economic equation, 
understanding that this structural problem is buttressed by the belief that artists are compensated in ways that transcend commerce, like the intangible rewards of the so-called creative process, love, satisfaction, passion, and self-expression, and that this misguided belief is compounded by the promise of exposure in lieu of financial compensation. Wage was brought into this world by some of these women, and as such, wage was brought into this world by feminists. Wage was initiated with the writing of a Wo Manifesto, and while the Wo Manifesto makes no mention of women artists in particular, Wage was and is inherently a feminist project. Our Wo Manifesto concludes with this now familiar refrain, if you're familiar with Wage. We demand payment for making the world more interesting. This demand has come to imply that artists should expect compensation for the work of making art, and that we should be paid for our labor as artists, paid for the labor of making the world more interesting by virtue of being artists. We demand payment for making the world more interesting can also be understood as a glib acknowledgement that we understand our designated role in providing a very particular brand of interesting, a non-threatening kind of interesting, one that can be monetized and seamlessly generate profit for others. It can certainly be understood this way, but to be clear, this refrain should not be understood simply as a demand for wages. Exactly 40 years ago, in 1975, Silvia Federici, with whom I am grateful to share this stage, wrote Wages Against Housework, a call to arms for the revolutionary international campaign known as Wages for Housework, which she co-founded in 1972. Wages for Housework identified housework and childcare as the foundation of all industrial labor, since the work of women in the home provided the conditions that enabled the reproduction of labor power. Without it, factories would be empty. Demanding that women be compensated and paid as waged labor points to the subjection of women, but also to the source of their subjection, capitalist relations, the source of all subjection for those who don't own the means of production. Sylvia's text opens with this passage, quote, Many times the difficulties and ambiguities which women express in discussing wages for housework stem from the reduction of wages for housework to a thing, a lump of money, instead of viewing it as a political perspective. The difference between these two standpoints is enormous. To view wages for housework as a thing rather than a perspective is to detach the end result of our struggle from the struggle itself and to miss its significance in demystifying and subverting the role to which women have been confined in capitalist society." End quote. A very similar point can be made with regard to the work of wage. So let's see what happens if I take this passage and replace each mention of women with artists and housework with artwork. Quote, Many times, the difficulties and ambiguities which artists express in discussing wages for artwork stem from the reduction of wages for artwork to a thing, a lump of money, instead of viewing it as a political perspective. The difference between these two standpoints is enormous. To view wages for artwork as a thing rather than a perspective is to detach the end result of our struggle from the struggle itself and to miss its significance in demystifying and subverting the role to which artists have been confined in capitalist society." End quote. It's not a real quote because I changed it. Um, <laughs> this raises an important question. What is the role to which artists have been confined in capitalist society? Like everyone else, the role to which artists have been confined in capitalist society is one that serves capital. As such, the role of artists in capitalist society is not exceptional. Our labor is not exceptional in its support of an exploitation by a multi-billion dollar industry. It is also not exceptional in how its status as a labor of love is precisely what has led to its devaluation. And while it is true that we have been confined to a role that serves capital, we have also been confined to a role in which we are expected to work against it. Art institutions expect us to question and attempt to alter the aesthetic, political, material, social, and economic conditions from and within which we operate. Thus, our exceptionality lies in our ability to, wor to work both inside and outside of capitalism at the same time, to draw from and work against. The problem is that we have been led to believe that we shouldn't get paid to be in this position, that we don't have the right to be the exception to the rule. From my point of view, it is only once we lay claim to our exceptional status that we can begin to fully engage our political potential as artists. It is precisely our exceptionality that we must both acknowledge and put to work. This means claiming the privilege of having it both ways. It means believing that we can be both critical of the system within which we work and get paid for it, 
That privilege should be our demand and it should not be an exceptional one. Our exceptionality is, or should be, that we get to have it both ways because everyone should get to have it both ways. The right to exceptionality is the demand. But this having it both ways only describes our status, which, until something is done with it, until it is put to work, it remains more of a state of being, a state of exception, a state of stasis. More work is required to turn it into a politics. Putting our exceptionality to work means engaging our labor on political terms and as a political act, not as an artistic gesture. This means demanding compensation for the work that we do when we engage with the forces of capital, because it is precisely this demand that activates our political agency within it. But remember that having it both ways isn't free or unconditional. It isn't a gift. We have to work for it and risk something by doing so, which means constant struggle and being prepared to take a position. Taking a position means being prepared to withhold your labor when necessary, because it's only once we've organized effectively around non-payment within our own field that we can align ourselves with other workers' struggles. Before we can align ourselves with other workers' struggles, we must be prepared to occupy our own exceptionality, however uncomfortable and as politically as possible. Hey, um, I'm Melanie Gilligan, as Marina said. What I'd like to present as my contribution to the discussion this evening is actually a video work I made called The Common Sense. What The Common Sense is, is it's an experimental narrative drama in the style of a television miniseries, which tells a science fiction narrative set in the future. Its story revolves around a technology that overlaps people's physical sensations, embodied experiences, and affects. When people use it, they encounter a total simultaneity of their experience of the world with that of another person. And so, as such, it ends up being a technology of potential collectivity. But the way that potential is actually used is something I'm going to talk about. One on the roof of the mouth, the technology is called the neural entrainment device, but it is more often referred to by the nickname, the patch. And so now I'd like to show a clip. Um, so maybe if we could dim the lights a little. Thanks. So, we're continuing to look at entrainment this week. We use the patch all the time. In fact, we're so familiar with it, we probably think we don't need to study it. Lena! No blips during class. Sorry, but I have to. Fine. It's your tuition money. <laughs> Which reminds me, tuition repayment work from 4 to 7 p.m. today. We're working on a new project for Gelatin Unlimited. I brought in something to show you. Sorry, Gibson. I just got a message from my job. I have 10 minutes to respond. Do you mind? Go ahead. I'm going to show you a video. Is this one of those cheesy early patch programs? No, it's from before the two-way models. It's called the common sense. In fact, your parents might have told you about it. All through human history, we have wanted to connect. 
In the beginning there was the patch one way. The one way is about experiencing someone else's emotions in real time. When someone else's feelings change how you feel, it can change your world. With the two way we've found a way to take it to a whole new level. Your brain waves will send at the same time as you receive. With the two way we can act and create together. We don't know where this will lead. It's a new design for the human being, and it's for you to find out. I have been waiting for this day for three years. I would like to present to you the two-way. The first two-way entrainment device where users send their experience and receive at the same time. We have overcome incredible obstacles, hardware and software design to bring this product to the market today. This device is going to blow your mind. Well, the difficulty is that 70% of people have been left out of the production of goods and services in the economy, and only 20% of those people have been able to find work through the patch. Um, okay, so that's the end of the clip. Um, as, you can, as you can tell just from that short clip, which I'm only going to show a little, little bit of the film uh, because we, we have so much to discuss tonight, but as you can see, uh, the, that moment that's being dis shown in the film, the moment of the, the patch's existence, is a moment that I suppose combines both the, the so-called new economy that we live in, but also um, gives a sense of the income disparity as well, and, um, and uh, the general sort of crisis within the economy. Um, and one indication of that is the kind of mention of work <laughs> going on in the classroom, the kind of like parallel working while, while learning. Um, but there's a lot that goes on in the film and um, a lot more um, to discuss. So I'll just, I have a, a text I'll continue with um, to kind of try to sum up some of the major themes that I think are pertinent to the discussion tonight. The film's story begins at the moment you just saw, when a new version of the patch has just been developed, evolving the device from a single directional tool, where one simply gets voyeuristic access to other people's experiences, to a new two-way model that allows for feedback and interrelation between users. The story spans the period of a decade and shows the social and political effects of the patch over time. I made this film wanting to deal with some questions. The first is, what would it mean to imagine undoing our individual subjecthood? How would it unsettle the current relationship between individual and collective as it is experienced and practiced? Secondly, how can this first question be brought to bear on how economic and technological conditions shape social relations and in, that, in turn subjectivities? This, <laughs> that's an interesting noise um, in light of the talk I'm giving. This story brings up a lot of concepts and also conventions related to collectivity. I wanted to focus on the impact this technology would have in the world specifically processes that are political, economic, and social. This idea initially came about from a series of thoughts I'd been having on money and its role in capitalism. Money mediates people's various and sometimes opposing needs by serving as a general, universal equivalent for all things. The idea of the film grew out of a question. What if there was a technology that made people experience not only their own needs, for example, their hunger, thirst, or the things they want, but those of others, as if they were their own. This could confuse the basic specificity of one's condition as uniquely one's own. I began with this idea of needs overlapped and not separate or opposed, but then I asked how would the... Whoops, sorry. How would the technology be used in our current reality? My initial premise for the film was pretty quickly transformed into, an, into a wariness about the actuality of such a technology, of what the actuality of such a technology could entail. The story takes us through two time periods in the development of the patch. 
Its early moments, when many people saw the technology as a potential tool for collective transformation and action, and a later time frame, when the patch has become anything but liberatory. While the patch may hold incredible potential, when put into a world of capitalist accumulation, it takes on a very different form. To a large extent, the work is therefore a contemplation of how this newfound technology becomes a way of tapping the potential of collectivity in order to regulate, regulate more effective regimes of work. The common sense takes place in a context of mass joblessness and underemployment and asks what sort of strategies people use to survive in such conditions. The film initially shows many situations where people are being pushed to labor more intensely through the patch. Yet as the story moves into a later period, the agency doing the pushing becomes more and more indirect. It is no longer a boss that pressures employees, but many different characters in the film pressuring one another, all with different degrees of distributed social agency, they themselves in turn pushed by some other necess necessity equally mediated by capitalist value. People in this time are very careful to maintain their social contacts in order to have access to the meager work opportunities that exist, and this is one of many ways that qualities of collective social interaction become treated as an economic resource in my imagined scenario. In this case, both corporations and job hunters employ the technology to make to make use of the social as a resource. In fact, in the case of the corporation, their business models are built on the desperation of the latter group. <laughs> the overstretched, unemployed person becomes useful to them, as we see in the now familiar strategies of many technology companies. The film's context is a lot like now, in that the lines separating labor from other unwaged activities are constantly blurred, and that blurriness allows um, one's time to be more heavily exploited. In both situations, in both the situation um, of the film and now, many new technological developments allow for more flexible, invasive ways that people can rent, rent their labor and time. But the point of the patch and the story of the patch is not just to think about contemporary phenomena like Uber or TaskRabbit, but rather to ask a larger question about what aspects of, this, of social life are really being re-engineered here. How are people made to adapt? And what are the cumulative effects of the social for the social environment? In the future scenario of the film, one senses a palpably different equality to social interaction. And this is because of the role the technology plays on subjectivation. In this reality, the imperatives exerted by the operation of value have made such deep inroads into their social, re into social relations and therefore psyches. So in a sense, the patch indeed makes things more collective, but it is a, collective that is a collectivity that is made useful to capitalism, as so many forms of collective work are today. At the point where my story begins, non-individualistic being has not been undone by this increased collectivity, but instead current ways of interacting are mostly preserved. There is a definite emphasis in my sci-fi premise on issues related to that, to what is traditionally seen as feminine labor. The patch transmits sensation, affects, and bodily experience, but not thought. This autom automatically opens avenues in the story regarding the types of social norms and work women were historically confined to, including affect labor, in waged work, and in the home. In the film, one of the major aspects of the technology is that it in intensifies collective labor and the incursion of work into the intimate nooks and crannies, not just of subjectivity, but of intersubjective social relations. Throughout the work, a question emerges. Could the patch look different in another better social and economic situation? Would it reflect different and potentially positive possibilities? About half an hour into the film, the patch network breaks down and widespread panic ensues. The device became part of the fabric of daily life, enforced formally and informally through social norms. Now, when the patch eventually turns now when the patch turns on, and then eventually, um, sorry, now when the patch breaks down, 
and then eventually turns back on, the story splits into two narratives. From this point onwards, the narrative breaks into two different stories, one where, one where a period of social unrest erupts in response to the major corporate losses created by the patch shutdown, losses which are then passed on to the people, while in the other situation, things go on as before. The first story shows many of the characters becoming part of political movements, direct action, and riots to resist this culture where the imperative to make oneself available to work takes precedence all over all else. In this period, we see people explore the collective potential of the patch, which were therefore somewhat ignored, or very much ignored. Meanwhile, on the other hand, the other, um, the other narrative trajectory shows the same world where the patch returns online and the rupture that the shutdown is, and the rupture, the rupture that has happened is normalized with things returning to business as usual. And that is the end of my talk. <laughs> Don't look at my notes <laughs> as I find them. Hello, everyone. My name is Sean. All righty. And <laughs> so you don't get it wrong. Sean to Smith Cruz, but you can call me Sean. And uh, let's make sure it's running. Okay, good. So I want to cover. Oh, nope, nope. It's an old computer. I want to cover the organizational, and uh, I want to give you an organizational case study, but before I even tell you what I'll cover, let me introduce myself. Um, I'm a librarian and an archivist, and I volunteer with collectively run organizations. So wait, let me go back here, because I'm still at this point. Many of the organizational structures that I've worked for and within the past have been focused on LGBTQ communities, um, that stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer communities, and they include the constituency or those identities, those stable identities, as those who operate the organization. So this connection to LGBTQ communities are significant because they require the stable collective identity in order to operate sustainably um, and for a sustainable future. So the groups that I'm going to name uh, in this talk are the Lesbian Herster Archives and the Wild Cafe Theater. Has anybody heard of any of these two? Yay! Oh, damn! Wonderful. Welcome. Welcome back. Each of these um, I identify as collectively run organizations. Their points of um, connection are that they're both they're collectively run. Uh, they have no paid staff. And they, um, the fact that there is no money moving within the people who run the organization means that their structures um, of volunteer run make it valuable. And, it, and since we're talking about value, we're going to focus on that. Um, they don't require paid labor to operate. Uh, but before I mention the Lesbian Hearst Archives, I want to talk about another organization um, which does have paid staff, even though they're part-time. So I'm going to use the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies as a uh, case study, which is actually the Center for, Lesbian, for, Center for LGBTQ Studies, CLAGS, so it's at the Graduate Center in CUNY. Um, and then consider the radical potential of queer politics by briefly mentioning Kathy Cohen's Punks, Book Daggers, and Welfare Queens, and then go back to our stable collective identities and the LHA and WOW, which you already know so well, so I'm not going to go that deep into it. Uh, but the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies is a leading LGBTQ academic center, and it's the first of its kind. It's located at the Graduate Center. I worked there as memberships and fellowships coordinator for a few years, and during that time, so a few years, sometime around, say, 2009 to, say, 2012, sometime around that time. Um, and during that time, I helped to plan events and programming and... Um, most of what I was helping to do was to place the LGBT academic landscape on the map, which is the, uh, on the map of the fields of uh, academia, which is what CLAGS's mission was. 
and is. During my time there, I also helped administer the launch for the Robert Giard Fellowship, which was the first award to an artist promoting LGBT film or photography, and not solely scholarship or just academic scholarship or written scholarship. So my time there began as a series of, uh, began a series of staff changes. Um, and it went from I as the only black lesbian staff person in what was traditionally a majority white office to an eventual turnover of an all woman of color staff um, under the direction of the director who was a white woman, Sarah Chin. She, I like to call her a white dyke English professor. Um, and her legacy stemmed from lesbian organizing in the 90s. So part of the staffing shift um, also led to a, a shift in programming, right? So. Um, the event coordinators, I like to put pictures of lesbians in my presentations. Um, <laughs> so I picked the two sexiest ones I could think of. So um, Ariane Benford was the uh, coordinator of programming, our program coordinator, and Jasmine Burnett was the development director. And what you found was that for two years, because a majority of the staff, except, all except for uh, Yasmina Sinanovic, who is a burlesque beauty, and the director, Sarah Chin, everyone else was a woman of color, and that changed the dynamic for the fund, how, where the funding was given, what events were happening, who was receiving money out of this organization. Um, so I would say it changed the organizational structure in two dramatic ways, even though it had been around for 30 years for the first time. The, there was performance led by queer women of color artists, most of whom had been networked via a woman of color cabaret, which was Wild Cafe Theater's uh, Rivers of Honey. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. And the performances ended up being juxtaposed with the scholarship, and so there were grantings to lesbians of color for their scholarship as well. The second thing that happened, unfortunately, was that uh, the funding dwindled. The networks that were traditionally the funding source of this organization were, um, as we can only imagine, the, the boys' network, um, primarily white gay men, or there were some academic circles of women, um, but they were essentially not the communities that the black lesbian community organizer turned development director had access to, although she has had experience doing development for years prior to that position. So post Sarah Chin's um, direction, she actually did the Lesbians in the 70s conference. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'll move faster. Um, we had another uh, white gay man who was the director and, uh, you know, professor of theater, Jim Cronin, very nice guy. And, of course, only uh, practically overnight, the staff switched back to an all-white staff. And as, as, you know, other than Yasmina Sinanovic, our burlesque beauty, the rest were really beautiful gay boys who like to walk around the office and smile at Jim. So the programming shifted to the work, um, and I would even say homonationalism and pinkwashing was the big event. Um, theater was still discussed, but it was focused on white feminists, um, such as Holly Hughes and Jill Dolan, who, um, you know, surprise, not surprising, were also part of the founding of Wild Cafe Theater, which we'll come back to. Um, so post-Jim, we then have another shift in staffing, and that is the first uh, uh, person of color to staff the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies. And um, that, so let's say we're fast-forwarding to 2012, and uh, Kevin Adal became the director for Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies, and the first thing he did was change it to the Center for LGBTQ Studies, and really considered the constituency for which the organization was serving its work, or rather, what is the stable collective identity that we're focusing on as an organization? So December 2012, you know, marks um, a really a poignant moment in history when a grand jury decided um, against the indictment of a New York officer who murdered Eric Garner, and it created a stir. And some may remember the dines that happened in Grand Central Station as an example of that. And although it was, um, so the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies has a, uh, and one of the awards that it has is called the Kessler Lecture. And the Kessler Lecture is given to a scholar who has over a number of years produced a substantive body of work that has had a significant influence in the field of GLBTQ studies. Um, the wardy who was chosen for the year that Nadal was director was Kathy Cohen. And she had her talk um, on December 12th, which happened to be a week after, you know, the, or two weeks after the indictment. And the community really poured into the Graduate Center. I mean, literally, there was, lines went outside the door, and you had to, the overflow room was filled with hundreds of people. And so her talk was titled, hashtag, Do Black Lives Matter? And the questions that she posed were based on identifying a radical potential for queer politics. And it mirrored an intersectional approach that she had all, that she, as a, say, founding board member of the Audre Lorde, 
Lord Project, um, which is a queer people of color organization in Brooklyn. Um, she brought in the conversations that she um, had already elicited in her essay that she wrote in 1997, which is called Punks, Bill Daggers, and Welfare Queens. And I'll just read briefly that she mentions, I'm talking about a politics where the non-normative and marginal positions of punks, bull daggers, and welfare queens, for example, is the basis for progressive transformative coalition work. And then she goes on to say, if there is any truly radical potential to be found in the idea of queerness and the practice of queer politics, it would seem to be located in its ability to create a space in opposition to dominant norms and a space where transformational political work can begin. And the reason why that's important is because queerness by definition is destabilizing. And in fact, um, there's an essay written by uh, Joshua Gamson who asks, must identity movements self-destruct a queer dilemma? And he says that there is an assumption that stable collective identities are necessary for collective action, um, but this is turned on its head by queerness. And the question becomes, when and how are stable collective identities necessary for social action and social change? And I would answer, always. Um, and one example of that would be then the Lesbian Her Story Archives, which is an organization that is based on the existence of stable collective identity. Um, it is, it, it's over 40 years old, and it's never had a single staff person work in its doors, and yet it is the largest um, and oldest lesbian archive in the world. And its set of principles requests and demands that money never circulates through government funding, but it is always open to receiving money from the community, and it is open to all who identify as lesbian. And through the Lesbian Her Story Archives, um, we have a series of events, and we, uh, a lot of what I do there is pr um, provide events, and I was gonna do like a whole like visual presentation of that, but maybe later. And then also the WOW Cafe Theater, um, I was part of for 10 years working on an, um, a show called Rivers of Honey, which is also um, a woman of color space, volunteer run, collectively run, and it was open, and the theater itself is open to all who identify as women and trans. And so this sort of ability to hold space for a specific collective identity will bring people to it, to the space, and the social change is possible. In fact, through Rivers of Honey, we now have uh, multiple shows and cabarets that have gone on for years because there was this initial space for people to get started in their work. And so I'm not sure what artist space, for example, if it's owned by the community and how the community re relates to the space. But I would argue that the, 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 the formula for value, which I actually just did this when somebody was talking, so I don't know what it looks like. I'm not a visual artist, but the, the social change is possible when we have spaces that are based on stable collective identities. And that is what I would call community. And queerness, in some ways, um, you know, disrupts that possibility. And so I have lots to say about that. But in general, I would market that to value. So that's where I'll stop. Uh, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I have better to calibrate this. Um, I'm Silvia Federici, and uh, as uh, some of you have known me over the years, uh, I have been involved in many different organizations during my now quite long life. But at the same time, my most important and uh, for me transformative uh, political involvement has been in the women's movement, and in particular in the campaign that was talked about tonight, the campaign for wages for housework. And I was involved in uh, an organization called the New York Wages for Housework Collective, which in fact had a storefront in Brooklyn. Now, unfortunately, sign of the time, it's a legal office. Uh, and, uh, but the, the New York Collective was also part of a much broader network that spanned several countries. Uh, so it's very interesting for me now to see, in particular in the last few years, how there's a whole new generation of women and also men uh, who are interested, they want to learn about wages for housework, and in particular, um, women who are using our analysis, our analysis of domestic work, 
and uh, the perspective on wages for housework, to look at, uh, for example, artistic work, and uh, to rethink you know, the great expansion of unpaid labor you know, the, in every sector, in every work sector has taken place over the last uh, two, three decades. And in fact, when Lisa was speaking, I was thinking also about um, uh, another artist, Laura Pta, you know, who is here in New York. I don't know if she's in the audience, but Laura has used the analysis of wages for housework to rethink Facebook and to show that actually Facebook it uh, hides an enormous amount of unpaid labor. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, you know, she has used an article that I wrote called Wages Against Housework, which started saying they call it love, we call it unpaid labor. And she say, well, they call it friendship, but actually it's all unpaid work. <laughs> and so this is especially interesting because uh, the wages for housework, the perspective, the demand, the campaign was very much uh, um, unappreciated uh, at, uh, in the 70s by feminists, by leftists. In fact, we were generally accused of wanting to institutionalize women in the home, you know, of basically demanding a payment for the work so that women could be continuing to do this work in the same form. And we were also accused of um, you know, opening, making the, opening the, 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 the road to a state intervention into the house, into people's lives, on the assumption that somehow family life and the domestic work in particular you know, were areas of pristine social relations, you know, social relations unaffected, you know, by uh, capitalist, uh, by capitalist uh, motivation, by capitalist control. Um, so, um, this was, of course, uh, for us, extremely surprising, because, uh, and particularly, certainly for myself, because I always looked at wages for housework. When I heard women speaking about it for the first time, it was like an explosion in my brain, and it was uh, something that, to me, immediately uh, sounded extremely revolutionary, because, in a way, it was like taking off from our skin, taking off from our life, you know, so many uh, identities, so many uh, imposed forms of behavior, and so many assumptions about uh, what it meant to be a good woman in, in society. And uh, to actually, you know, say, you know, we want to be paid for all of this, you know, was for us such a powerful instrument of refusal. That in fact, to be accused of wanting to institutionalize women in the home was uh, seemed uh, completely un unimaginable. And in fact, I wrote in uh, Still in Wages Against Stars work that uh, this, this demand, this perspective, was, uh, is where our nature ends and our struggle begins. You know, we saw it really as a lever to undo you know, the whole uh, feminine identity and begin to show that all the attitudes attributed to us as women were actually work skills, were also always work requirements required by the fact that we had to produce and reproduce uh, the workforce, etc. You know? So um, today, Looking backward, I, I very, very often uh, recognize that uh, you know, our intuition, that this was a very important strategy for the women's movement, that that intuition was a correct one. Because when I see, in fact, the path that the feminist movement has taken, you know, it's a path that has led in the, over the last three, four decades 
to a great crisis of reproduction. You know, a, in a crisis of reproduction that of course cannot be imputed to the feminist movement, but certainly the feminist movement has not been able to oppose in any really significant way. And by crisis of reproduction, I refer to the fact that now unpaid labor in the home continues, that in fact, you know, women now are doing two, three jobs. Another reason behind the demand for wages for housing was the refusal to celebrate, the refusal to identify capitalist work and wage work as a form of liberation. You know, what we asked with wages for housing was to be paid for what we were already doing and to reappropriate wealth we had already created and, uh, and, and having the possibility to refuse, to demand more work and to associate the demand for more work, you know, with uh, a path to more liberation. Uh, so, uh, today I see that uh, I, we, we had an intuition that was correct because women are still institutionalized in the home. Uh, but many often, you know, they are institutionalized as paid worker, not only as unpaid worker, but as paid worker. As we all know, there's been a globalization of domestic work, no? Not only care work, domestic work. Now everybody talks about care work. There's no more domestic work. I don't know what has happened. Something happened in the last few decades that nobody cleans floors any longer. Everybody does care work. It seems to be the only type of concern, but this is another issue. Um, so, uh, to conclude, because we have uh, many things to discuss tonight, to conclude, presently, I'm uh, very interested not only in wages for housework and, uh, and, and the struggle in general, beyond wages for housework, in the struggle against all the unpaid labor, the capitalism, imposes on us, which is what keeps this pernicious system, you know, con to continue to reproduce itself. But I'm very interested also in what I call the politics of the common, you know, and by which I refer to the many, many efforts, you know, the women and men are making across the world, including in New York, you know, to begin to change immediately some of the conditions of our reproduction and, uh, and to create forms of reproduction already in the present that are more autonomous from the market and autonomous from the state. And um, I'm very interested also in seeing how particularly in an environment like you know, New York and like the cities of the United States, you know, the struggle over the wage in whatever form can also be conjugated together, articulated together with the struggle for the commons. This presently is one of my main concerns because it's clear that we live at a time in which we cannot completely abstract from monetary relations. And uh, no matter how successful we are in building community, in building commons, nevertheless, we still don't have the social power to escape monetary relations. So the question is, what kind of struggle that we can make over the wage, who instead of tying us more to capitalism, can begin to open ways you know, to, to go beyond capitalism. And in this process, you know, the question of the relation between the commons and the wage for me is really fundamental. Thank you. So, I, well, I said, I, I guess we should open it up quite, quite soon, but maybe just to kind of initiate a discussion here and also see if the people who are up here also have questions or comments they might want to pose to one another as well. Um, maybe I'll, I'll just start with something that picks up on the end of our workshop this daytime, which also uh, Sylvia concluded with 
as well. And I guess that's a question of how, what, what strategies, what circulations of value within, across, between communities can precisely build kind of resist, resistance um, out of the practices of prefiguration that structure communities rather than the communities of capital um, which are always atomized and super exploited individually and as a collective that Melanie uh, visualizes in her film. I actually, sorry to do this to you, Sean, but I, I would love to hear more about um, separatism as a, as a strategy, mm -hmm. if you're interested yeah, in talking actually, about that. actually, that was that. my second question. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. Separatists don't like to talk about themselves. It's a separate conversation. Um, <laughs> but I'll do my best to not, you know, speak, in t speak on the internal, externally. Um, so I would say that the concept of stable collective identities is in some ways synonymous to separatism in that um, there's the assumption that if we are working toward a common goal um, and that goal is based on an identity um, and that identity is stable and it's also a collective um, then the work that we do will stay within within the, the structure within the group structure um, and then so with that, so to just make that, um, relate that to real life, um, in order for the Lesbian Herster Archives to, or rather, in order for Wild Cafe Theater, because we're in our art space, to maintain itself, it had to really define who it was. And initially, WOW started as a women's theater space. And then sometime in the early 2000s, so something like 10 years ago, there was conversation about defining woman, right? Like, what is a woman? How does gender define in the space? And a lot of the women um, were moving outside of their own gender identities and moving to being men or being identifying as men. And the question of whether or not they could stay within the collective was a real question. And there was a, a huge shift in the membership. A lot of people really just left the organization and the organization weakened as a result of uh, women becoming men and essentially leaving their stable identity. And so in order for there to be a response to that, um, and what, you know, what women tend to do is they sort of open up, right, their legs to receive um, men, right? And so uh, I think that that action of sort of, I don't know, heterosexist responses um, allowed for the identity to really destabilize. Um, and that obviously, I'm on one side of the argument in that regard. So that was not a separatist move. That was the opposite of a separatist move. What ended up um, coming from that was uh, more trans women um, being a part of the theater space than trans men. So really, right now, you just don't really see trans men. You see more trans women. Um, and so it's still, in some ways, a women's space because men really just don't want to be there at the end of the day. They want it to be allowed, right? Um, but then they didn't necessarily want to participate. Um, so really it's still become something of a true women's uh, organization and, and it's become uh, more stable as a result of really gaining um, an understanding of what that collective identity looked like and restabilizing it. So I hope that helped answer the question. You know, I was also curious, just interested to hear, or maybe you could talk more about um, uh, how these separatist spaces are funded or not funded, how they refuse funding, and how mm -hmm. that uh, sort of in, um, maintains a certain level of autonomy that's critical to retaining value in this particular way, or making yeah. that valuable not available to, to re be recuperated in uh, other ways. Well, I like that Sylvia said um, that you know, women ought to be paid for the work that we are already doing, because I think that that has a lot to do with um, how the separatist spaces work and that there's a structure that has to exist in order to get the work done. So whether it's creating theater or, or creating an archive, we do the work and the work is not questioned in value because in some ways it's a priceless process, right? There's no way. So if it were creation of art, we can't really um, 
quantify it, but we can create um, a system where what we're already doing has money moving inside of that structure. So for the theater, there would be like a door fee, right? And that would help to fund the theater space. Or for the archives, there would be, you know, just asking people to support the work that is essentially priceless and can't be quantified with um, monetary value. And that has worked for the past 40 years. So I think that that is, um, there is something about it being on the fringe or outside of the capitalist structure that makes people feel like it is important for it to exist, and so people will support that. So really it's pushing money outside of the structure of doing the work, um, and then seeing money as a separate entity that is not really um, going to fund, it's not going to quantify the work that we're already doing, but the work has to happen. Um, do you guys have other questions you want to sort of put to one another before we open it out to everyone else? No? I can ask another I can ask another question while, sorry, I'm like the uh, questioner. Um, I just, I, I was just really interested sort of in, in, as we were organizing this panel, thinking about whether the commons and separatism are two strategies that are at odds with each other. And I wondered um, what, Sylvia, you might, if, if there's anything to be said around that, whether they're, yeah, whether they can coexist or are they, are, are they uh, detrimental to one another? You know, I, I'm not sure, I'm not so sure about uh, really what separatism means today, you know, they, uh, because, uh, you know, we, the feminist movement, there was a lot of discussion in, in uh, both uh, in the black power movement, in the feminist movement in the 70s, between the question of autonomy, of separatism, right? And so there were all these distinctions, which meant that uh, you had to be autonomous because otherwise you couldn't even begin to recognize the sources of your exploitation. At the same time, there were terrains of uh, alliance where you could, and this was an important difference between separatism and, uh, and autonomy. So I'm not so sure in what sense it is now being talked about. So, in, uh, but um, when, when I think of commons, I do not think uh, necessarily of uh, social practices based on any particular identity. I'm thinking of social practices, you know, based on transformation of social relations, but not necessarily built. So I don't think of, of uh, women's commons, but I think of, of reproductive commons, for instance. That is, commons that uh, place the issue of reproduction at their center, right? And uh, try to create forms of reproduction that are cooperative. You know, uh, unlike uh, the present situation in which reproduction is organized in all these little cubicles and little prisons that we call our homes, you know, where women have been traditionally totally isolated and separated, not completely because there's been community struggles and so forth, right? But it's very clear that there's been a long standing, you know, uh, feminist aspiration to create different forms of reproduction, and I think not only feminist, to create forms of reproduction that are more collective, that are more and less isolating, and also give us more strength, more capacity for resistance. And so, and you know, the question of reproduction is central to it, because unless we begin to transform, first of all, you know, the most important activity, the activity that produces our life, you know, it's very difficult to imagine that we can change also the rest of society. In fact, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we began uh, long before Occupy, years ago, some of you are too, too young to remember, and there were, uh, for the time, discussion, particularly after, you know, after Seattle, Quebec, you know, when you had this major, major demonstration with thousands and thousands of people in the street, you know, and then all of a sudden things seemed to collapse. And so we had all this uh, discussion about, uh, 
you know, how do you make sure that uh, the movement doesn't, in a sense, boil up and then collapse, so we have these continuous uh, oscillations of sense of great power and, and, and yet. And uh, one of the conclusions we came to was uh, precisely that we needed to have a type of politics that uh, didn't separate, you know, the moment of political engagement with the moment of reproduction. They began to actually politicize our reproduction and uh, in the process creating relationship about people that would be much more solid, much more built on solidarity, you know, than the one that you have when you join a demonstration of 10,000 people and, and, and see that as the predominant form of activity. So we saw that we've extremely, we spoke about the idea of building self-reproducing movements, you know, and in a way, for me, the idea of the common, it's an idea that is very uh, expresses, you know, that, that conception of political work. And I think that, well, I don't want to talk too much, but I think that today, that experience is really taking ground. Um, in the US, outside of US, you know, um, I think, for example, in many, many parts of Latin America, without even thinking of the Zapatista, without even thinking of the movement of the landless people, but in many, many urban territories, many urban areas, you know, you find many people who, for whom the state has nothing, nothing to offer, for whom the market has nothing to offer. People have been, in many cases, completely dispossessed, and because of that, they had to build their reproduction, you know, mm -hmm. from, with their hands. And at the same time, in those situations, you always find uh, that something really new is happening. It, it, there it, is something really new that is important, is, is coming into existence. Maybe we're advocating for a collective separatism from the state. Mm. Yes, <laughs> separatism from the state, very good. <laughs> very good, I like that. <laughs> <clears throat> are there um, are there questions mm -hmm. and comments uh, amongst amongst all of you um, or any of you? I I can just join in. Yeah. Um, I think it's a really it's a really interesting discussion happening at the moment. Um, what I I think what I what when kind of Marina invited me to take part in this panel in the way. I was kind of imagining a discussion on value. Um, I was very aware that often, in, especially in a Marxist context, which is kind of the, the context I often operate in, and, and I know Marina, um, obviously many people here do, um, but often, often the discussion of value is one that is, um, that, uh, you know, it, it is conceived in a, in a quite systemic and abstract way. And um, one of the things that I thought was interesting about this panel and the approach of different people who are on this panel, um, and s a panel that both uh, kind of um, revolves a bit around the, the discussion around wages for housework and also around separatism, was that it was actually going into the particulars rather than the abstract of like how value ends up operating in these particular situations. Um, I wanted to just observe that I think it's interesting from, from seeing a bit of, of Sean's work um, and listening to the conversation that uh, Sylvia brought up and Sean brought up was that um, both of you were discussing reproducing our lives. Uh, Sylvia, you were just bringing it up, um, especially uh, in, in your discussion about social reproduction. Um, but also, um, Sean has brought up in other contexts that uh, you know, sometimes it's necessary to separate to a certain extent to make an area where it's possible for certain communities to reproduce their lives, whether it is because of systemic homophobia or racism or whatever sort of context that's in, that for certain subjects that's, that is the situation, or it is the situation in relation to capitalism in general, but, you know, um, we, we all end up having different sort of, um, ways that we have to relate to, to our particular, particular situations. And so I, th I thought that actually, in a way, um, that 
that is a really a, a very interesting point. We are, we're all mediated. We're all constantly in, in some sort of relationship to value at every point, but actually in terms of the particulars of our lives, it, it also kind of like divides and makes different situations which you have to manage differently. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. I, and I also agree that it is something like if choosing reproduction as an example um, is what unifies a group to move forward in, in action, then that is the separate group, you know, like those who identify with the movement for reproduction and keeping it as such and not say turning it into all production, right? But it's specifically reproduction. So an example that is current right now, specifically to the talk that I gave was the, black, the hashtag Black Lives Matter. And if um, a lot of the conversation around that hashtag, which I could give an entire conversation around whose hashtag is it, and who's, who started it, and who uses it, and et cetera. But instead, I'll make notice to the black in the Lives Matter, and that when um, one argument that most agree with who attach it to their movement building is that it is supposed to be Black Lives Matter, not All Lives Matter, Women's Lives Matter, Queer Lives Matter, because then it really does take away from the intention of its separate space that in order for people to pull into that um, that movement building or that portion of social change is to enter the space of Black Lives Matter and whether you're black or not to acknowledge it from that, pers that point of view. So that's an example of how potentially separatism could exist in the outside or what we like to call Area 51. <laughs> <laughs> Ask us questions. Yeah, we gave you a lot of material. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've been trying to think through the relationship between violence and exploitation. Specifically, not ex exploited work as violence, but the other side of it, like violent acts as forms of consumption of the other's body as forms of, um, you know, sort of, uh, as, 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 I'm not very far along on this, as you can see, but um, just in terms, I mean, I'm working on something relating to personality cults in the arts, and um, a lot of sort of discussions coming up around um, gender violence and how personality cults are gendered, and, um, so I've been, I've been trying to think through this kind of idea of um, how in, when you have personality cults, you have um, forms of property and through, via copyright, via, um, you have the opposite of a commons, right? And so I'm just, I guess I'm just wondering if, if, if anybody wants to pick up this kind of poorly thought out question. Um, this idea of consuming the body of the other, um, you know, things like rape, things like um, physical abuse, all, all these, these things that come up and that get sort of turned into very individualized narratives, like this is about a particular person, and rethinking it actually in terms of labor, in terms of exploitation, in terms of... Um, these are acts that somebody benefited from that somebody didn't want, somebody else didn't want to give. Um, so I don't know. Anyway, if you you can not you can answer or not answer. Um, okay. Can I jump in while others think about it, or did you want to go ahead? You wanted to go ahead. Well. Um I mean, the main thing that I, I kind of thought in response to what you were saying was really that it, it is very true um, that not only are the responses to these forms of violence you were talking about dealt with in an individualized manner in that they're supposed to be dealt with through legal systems and whatnot, but also that, that, um, that it's very much seen as, as an individualized condition and 
Um, although, although the sexism that leads to, um, to those sorts of violences is conceived of systemically, it, it, uh, it is often enough that it's actually, that it actually continues to be dealt with on an individual sort of level. I mean, that, that seems like the kind of, the, what ended up being the through sort of element in the things you were bringing up to me. Um, I mean, one thing that I was thinking is in general, it would be interesting to just kind of lay out how we see um, value and, and the place of wages for housework in our discussion of value, something that Marina and I have kind of have been having on, in an ongoing way. Um, we both write together and, and um, I suppose as I, I'm an artist, Marina is someone who writes from a kind of art theoretical perspective. Um, and I suppose with, when it comes to art, there are obviously in, an incredible amount of questions that relate to um, how art actually falls, obviously falls outside of the terrains that are normally considered, um, you know, waged or value productive or any of those things. And so I was, I was thinking that maybe, um, not so much that we should bring art into the conversation, but maybe, maybe talking about these, these sort of limit areas of value would be interesting for our discussion, just in terms of, um, you know, defining. Um, what those limits are. I remember, Sylvia, you were saying something about how care is a discussion mm -hmm. that comes up a lot at the moment. Um, and, and I was actually thinking about how your point about actually uh, care, affect, affective work, this sort of thing is not, is not the majority of what happens in housework, mm -hmm. um, housework that women do, but also that uh, that a lot, of, a lot of this is actually cleaning floors and, and you know, doing, doing the traditional actual manual labor. Um, but I, I, I suppose I, I was coming from a really different perspective in my, in my presentation when I was mm -hmm. trying to actually pinpoint kind of what areas of, I suppose, subjectivity and intersubjective sort of um, collective moments are actually end up being, end up being um, taken and useful to capital in various ways. And so I was wondering if you, like, you know, I think, I think one could describe the kind of present horizon of labor or te terrains of labor in terms of, on the one hand, n n new intangibles being able to be exploited in such a way, but at the same time that, that the kind of manual labors that uh, various types of a very concrete labor that happens all over the world and in, the, in both production and uh, in an expanded sort of uh, context of, I suppose, the things, that, I guess I'm what I'm trying to get at is those things that are defined are completely opposite to, let's say, what people talk about when they're talking about the financial economy, the new economy, mm -hmm. these sorts of areas that kind of supposedly float free from mm -hmm. capital's old productive terrain, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, so it would be interesting to just talk about like how we've actu we're actually in a moment of two poles in that way. Yeah, I think there's a tremendous amount of mystification, you know, now everybody now talks about financialization and the finance economy and uh, somehow it is self-generative, presumably, where in reality financialization, at the bottom of financialization, there is actually labor and there is the many, many incredibly labor-intensive form of work, you know, as uh, at the roots of uh, the digital production, you find people digging coltan with their own hands, you know, in places in uh, many parts of Africa, and you find forms of ex incredible amount of exploitation. Uh, so I think that that is very important. It's important, for example, you know, to also move away from the kind of uh, uh, celebratory position that many have towards the internet and so on, that doesn't look at the way uh, digital instruments are being produced. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, of uh, work, I mentioned about care work, because again, part of the mystification is this division between material and immaterial labor, right? This idea there's such a thing as immaterial labor. And well, at times, it might be useful to speak of immaterial labor in some context, mm -hmm. as uh, with the understanding that it's not actually a reality but to draw on certain points, on certain characteristics. But there's no such a thing as immaterial labor. And uh, I, I always, always repeat that uh, reproductive work is uh, the kind of work that shows it in a very you know, paradigmatic way. Because uh, when you do most domestic labor, for example, it's a really a, a mixture of emotional work and, and physical work, and extremely physical work, and they cannot be separated. The two, you cannot separate them. I also understand why, for example, there's been a tendency to use the concept of care work, mm -hmm. and I think uh, this has come particularly, in many ways, from domestic workers, paid domestic workers themselves, who have attempted to valorize their work, you know, have, have uh, wanted to show that uh, the work they do as nanny, as etc., is not only physical work. In other words, to speak of care work instead of domestic work has been a way to show that uh, the work they have do or they've done, it's work that has many dimensions and that requires many skills. And uh, there is, in fact, many activities uh, at once. And this is very important and is very true, right? The danger, however, when we continuously rehearse care work, care work, care work, and we never talk about domestic work any longer, we kind of erase, is creating a new hierarchy. You know, so then there is care work, and, and then presumably there is a lower level which is the level of uh, the cleaning and the, and the level of uh, mm. the, the cooking and etc. So we have to be very careful. Words have, have uh, you know, very practical, they have a whole realm of, of, of meanings that is important to keep in mind and in practice what they have. They have a politics attached to them mm -hmm. and it's very important. I want to add something before because I'm not sure if I made myself clear about the question of separatism. I think you can speak, for example, of an all-women uh, organization or group or a whole a group of all black people as a common. Uh, I think that the moment in which the commons goes beyond a, a social relation and, and tries to give itself a material basis and create a territory, create forms of self-government control, then it's important also to see where it begins to connect with the other commons, where it can begin to, what is the ground for uh, forms of, of alliances. Um, which many times, for example, in some of the earlier uh, conception of separatism was not always possible. So this is what I, I really meant, wanted to clarify. Um, I don't know if I reply, if I, Mm. Clarified. No, you did, yeah, for sure. Can I also add to it too? I agree, I think that like your definition of commons within a space where then they can be self-governing and um, self-forming and then move to other commons is essentially how I would identify separatism or define it. And since nobody but me is using that term, maybe I should just start saying the commons. But I'll think about it. But one thing I did want to uh, mention, especially in response to the question that was asked, um, in terms of violence and uh, consumptions of, of others' bodies, and I think when I, when I, if I translate that to the conversation we're having, others' bodies can be considered work, right? So if we can make that transition from violence of bodies to violence against or towards uh, labor, um, is to, and then you mentioned copyright. So there's an envisionment of, the, of a commons that we all know well as artists are the creative commons, right? And how um, there is a certain level of agency that is put to the individual, the body, the, the laborer, the creator of the work, the artist, the woman, put, you know, enter your, your person 
or your identity there, and that um, the violence that can go against the Creative Commons, I, I find, or, what it, or rather what, how the Creative Commons helps to rectify the violence that happens to bodies, or to workers, or artists, or women, is that it sort of outlines this, you know, tiered system, right, of access. And so I find that there is, um, in terms of conversations about the internet and value, and um, the, the, the conversation around open access, for example, and how all things ought to be freely accessible to everyone, right, um, really does push against a conversation of the agency of the creator and saying, no, actually, I want this to be open only to these people, right? I only want this to be open to women or to black people or what have you, or people who came to my event last week or whatever it is, right? So you have like this tension between, I think that's what you're referring to is the tension between separatism mm -hmm. and the commons is like this tension between open access and closed spaces. And um, the, for me, what makes the most sense is someone who sort of walks through the world in a separatist lens, but obviously interacts with others. I walk with that tension all the time, and the, I think that the Creative Commons does a good job of um, creating the agency or in the hands of the creator of the, art, of the work or the identifying person. Um, and what I call that agency building is consent, right? So it's like, you can't fuck me if I'm not giving you consent to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And so there is this, you know, you can use this piece if it's for non-commercial use, da 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 as we know what the, how the Creative Commons outlines its various levels of copyright, um, access, or various levels of access and use. So I think that that's an example of how um, violence can be rectified in terms of the body and how the tension between collective spaces and separatism can... I hope that made sense. Mm -hmm. Essentially, consent is yeah. the answer to the question. Yeah. An agency. Yeah, no, it totally made sense. And, and what you were just saying, actually, was making my mind return to the, our topic today, value, and how actually, you know, money, the market, value is seen as, in some way, creating, even by Marxists, seen as creating conditions that are unbiased in some way because, like, money just goes to wherever it, it is most profitable. And it's in that way conceived kind of as unbiased by both like finance people and Marxists alike, uh, some Marxists. Um, but actually, but actually n no, it doesn't. Like often enough within, within those situations, um, within particular, like various particular situations of lived relations, that actually isn't the case. Money is not in any way unbiased, or it's not m money necessarily. It's like money as something that people use, um, jobs as something that people give or have control over. Um, I was re reading a really interesting book recently by an author called Deirdre Royston, who is talking about um, blue collar, black blue collar um, workers in America. Um, African American and who were who were basically being um, unable to get jobs that white male workers were able to get, um, and it's precisely because of the kind of unfair sort of, I suppose, like uh, greater access that white um, that white workers have to informal social networks, and and I think that's something I I find interesting. Um, to look at is just like how how act actual forms of bias that are and and structural types of violence that are are out on on I suppose both the social and political realm interact with the operation of of money or value and how you know like I think I think there are actually a lot of sort of issues facing facing us today in this moment of austerity that that. Uh, end up kind of like amplifying various forms of um, what, again, I would call bias, um, but that, but like money or the, the kind of lack thereof and the, and the kind of, um, the kind of very unequal situation that's happening after the crisis ends up amplifying or, or just continuing to, and to continuing to worsen <laughs> certain situations that already are absolutely horrendous, you know? 
I mean, I, I think every, everything you've just said really just highlights how this kind of idea of a sort of abstractly un, unprejudiced or kind of e equivalence of the value form, how superficial that discourse is, particularly also in light of, for example, what Sylvia writes about in Caliban and the Witch, mm -hmm. just how if primitive accumulation is ongoing, there is no capitalism without violence. There's no abstraction without violence. There's no abstraction itself is a form of violence, of course. So if you think of co colonialism, if you think of slavery as being inex inextricable from capitalism as we know it um, anywhere in all history now as then, um, the I the idea that there's a kind of ab abstract pure value that doesn't care about particular qualities or social situations just seems like so utterly inane <laughs> if you're talking about capitalism. Mm -hmm. yeah, the production of value, capitalist value, is extremely violent. <laughs> Has been uh, the whole history of capitalism is a history of violence, is a history of dispossession, is a history of forcing people to do unpaid labor. You know, the families have been a place of latent violence, and the violence has been structural in the, in the family, because uh, after all, it's been one of the ways in which men have disciplined women to make sure that mm -hmm. they would do the job, <laughs> or parents discipline children so they can become good workers, you know, in the future, and that violence is totally legitimized and institutionalized. Mm -hmm. So capitalism is extremely, Violent, and today, in fact, not to mention the wars and not to mention you know, the process of colonization, etc. Um, I, I also want to say something about the, the, the internet because I think that what you said is really important. You know, the internet for me is, I, I find it very difficult to think of the internet as a common. You know, and and uh, for instance, you know, there is no real responsibility. You can, you can connect through the internet with all kinds of people across the world. But there's very little responsibility that people are using the internet have to each other. There's not much responsibility. People can, can write about you, can put things on the internet about you. There's very little that you can do you know, to protect yourself in that way, for instance. No? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, a common is not a kind of place where free for all. <laughs> It's not a, 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 a open access, you know, place, you know, like uh, a type of situation where you have land and anybody can go and, and take, but it's a place where there has a reciprocity of relation, where people have responsibility for each other and responsibility for the wealth that they are using. And I'm not sure that they, that exists in the case of, of the internet. Um, so I think we, we really have to think more seriously. And that's why many people who want to not have that kind of open access, because uh, it's really important when you put out, for instance, words, to who they go, who receives those words, what use is made of your words, all of your writing, all of your work. So I think that, uh, again, it's really, there's really a need for a more critical uh, approach also to the, to the internet. I'd be really interested to see if um, there's any... Anybody's protesting? <laughs> <Come on. laughs> I know, this is, this is very controversial anything. things we're saying up here. Amazing, we are not hearing it. Uh, yeah, I'm actually very interested in this idea of access and um, how it can refine the parameters of value within a particular group. Um, I guess this is sort of a question for Sean in the idea of that certain groups that maybe are more vulnerable to violence are required to have more um, restrictions on access parameters and can, as a result, maybe define the value very specifically and maybe abstract the idea of value within that particular group completely outside of a regular idea of value in the sense of no money's passing within um, the Her Story Library, for example. Um, but I wonder if the limited access is due in part to this level of vulnerability. Like, I mean, we're talking um, 
about asking for valorization of some particular labor versus valorization of lives, you know, to that degree, like, are certain groups, mm, do they just need to have a safer, more controlled space to then transfer that demand for a particular value outside of the group later? Is that something that makes you think of something to say? <laughs> I think I understand your question. Is it that the that groups who choose separate space do it because there is a, a larger sense of vulnerability and as a result cannot put value onto their well, No, not existence? who can't put value, but who need maybe a more secluded space to then have the freedom to define their own value and then to transfer that idea of value to other groups once they've had like the safety to decide what that is or to... Theoretically, yes. Theoretically, the assumption is that there's a need for separation in order to build, right? Whatever that building block, whatever the building is, I think it's um, really forging a space that doesn't exist elsewhere and making up for the, uh, the absence of whatever that identity is or making up for it, how it's been harmed or how it's been fouled in larger society. So um, if there's a need for, I think that when groups sort of gather, it's a response. It's usually a response to what's not there. It's a response to the lack. And so that does make it a vulnerable space because um, it's built on an assumption also that there, the society would be better without it and society is, not, is built to not allow for this space to exist, right? So I think the answer is yes. I guess if that's the, part <laughs> of what I'm thinking though is that like if there are these groups that are highly marginalized that then have more of a need because of their vulnerability to be completely separatist and extract themselves to some degree from the larger picture, like, is there a certain time lag that it takes for those groups to reincorporate themselves in a safe, productive way? And how does society, like, how can it be made clear to society that that value is lost because of its unhospitableness to that Oh, I understand group? what you're saying. And like, how do we... How is it reconciled? Right. At what point do you separate? At what point do you reintegrate? Right. Like essentially, like do this till the end, or when is the end, and how yeah, do you and reintegrate? And at what point is separation? Um, like a, the sort of like utopian idea. It's so funny that same question happened two weeks ago, like when someone said it. It's someone I I did a similar talk two weeks ago, and someone said this is like Mardi Gras. Um, and I was like, how did you hear that? And, and that was interesting. But so, so they, I think it would say that, um, I think that what defines a separatist, possibly other than, say, someone who's um, for the commons, is that a separatist doesn't want to come to an end and move, fo move into the larger society, that it's really about, like, I want to live and die in this space, right? And, like, I'm not interested in being outside of it. Um, and that this space will be maintained until the end. The assumption is that society will always be, in or, because, other, because other people exist, right? And it's not about killing off the rest of the world. It's about maintaining a separate space for yourself. And then you can exit that space. So like, there, it's almost like if we translate it to the internet, the internet is not going to be, um, Use, it can't be used as a commons or it can't be used as a utopian potential space for equality if everyone doesn't have like a certain number of, say, server space, right? Like if we don't all walk with server space and we have it when we're born, we get, everybody gets the same amount of server space and nobody gets more or whatever to make it equalize when there are institutions or, or companies that own 80% of the internet, it's never going to be an open access internet, right? So if that is the structure of the society, if we use the internet as an example of that structure, then, you know, and not to like speak against open access, just to put as a little precursor, librarians who speak for open access speak for it because the people who are owning all of the rights to access are the large corporations, right? And it's not necessarily the individual people who have autonomous access to things and then close it. It's usually a large corporation that closes it. And that's sort of the same um, 
to compare it to separatism, right? The, the, wor the larger institution of society is, say, Google, right? I mean, this is maybe not Google. I don't know, El Elsevier, right? Um, and so if you're a single you know, person and you want to own your space autonomously, um, then you have to keep it separate because otherwise it, it, it can't really be fed into that larger system. So I hope that answered the question. Yeah, it does. I guess it's just, I'm just curious about how the energy that's, that's sort of created within these separate spaces, energy and or value, is then transferred or translated into the world at large, or if it even has to be. Yeah, I think matters. it creates more, it re creates regenerative energy within that group, and then that group becomes larger, and eventually, because that group of people coexists with the world. So like Les Rivers of Honey, for example, which is a woman of color cabaret, um, when it was ha 10 years, every month, there's a performance, every single month in the same space, and the same people come, and then more people perform, and they're like, oh, I want to create one too. So now there's like three, you know, of the similar things, and then those people are now touring the country, and one person just went to Europe, and so now there's like actually a space to create this kind of work that wouldn't exist outside of it, there being a separate space, and so who knows where, the trickles will, you know, how they will be affected, but ultimately they can't even be birthed or conceived if those separate spaces didn't exist. But it also seems like a form of refusal to me, strategically speaking. It's like a way of saying, um, we refuse to participate in a system that just uh, essentially just is extracts value and leaves us, you know, broken to a certain extent. Whereas, uh, you know, another strategy, which I suppose is the strategy of wage and wages for housework is uh, to demand um, a piece of the wealth that we have already created, to demand compensation for wealth that we already generated, which artists do, I guess, through making works that end up circulating and creating enormous amounts of um, money for and profit for others. So to me, they seem... There's, there's, it's, it seems very strategic also, mm -hmm. um, as a kind of survival instinct as well, um, as a kind but of protective gesture. These are very different things, yeah. because separatism is a particular form of organization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a political problem. It, I mean, it's a political problem, but it's a particular form of organization, which is for housework, is a strategy to change relations of work, to change uh, relation to the wealth produced. So they are, they are very different things. Yeah. They're different. One is a political yeah. program, the other is a form of organizing. And I think that one right. f sort of informs the other. So another example of something that I would say was birthed out of separatism is say, I was just talking about this earlier, Afropunk, right? Like that started as like a single like DIY festival on a block in Brooklyn where like everybody who was doing it were just like lovers, right? And then now it's like this, you know, large institution that now, you know, they were supposed to have one this weekend in Atlanta, got canceled because it's raining. But the point is, is that um, who, they, when the, the small group of people were putting this together and when they were organizing and having meetings weekly, they didn't ha say, oh, our goal is to be rich and famous and have events all over the country. But now it sort of lives in this larger landscape and it can't be a separatist space, right? But it still maintains its title and identity so that the only people who can perform are people of a certain type. And so that now is a part of a larger world. Like anybody can come, right, and participate. So it changes the world without changing itself necessarily. But I would like to add something because I'm really not comfortable with the, the idea that, for example, separate forms of organization or autonomous forms of organization uh, and of course, you know, we could uh, define that a little bit more, uh, are necessarily in response to vulnerability. Uh, I think it's in response to something very different. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, you know, it's, it's in response to the recognition that this society is very hierarchically organized. And, uh, you know, the classic idea of unite and fight doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't work because uh, it, unless you begin to understand the specific forms in which you are exploited, the specific form in which you are violated, the specific form in which you are yeah. oppressed, you cannot organize effectively against it. Mm -hmm. So in a, in a way, it's really a, a requirement, a necessary requirement of struggle to be able to have a space in which you can articulate. 
and you can examine and articulate and organize around a specific form of your oppression, which has nothing to do with identity politics, which now is the great beast, you know? <laughs> but there is a, actually a material reality, which is called a division of labor, which is called hierarchies of labor. And uh, now many times, you know, they are crossed over, they are papered over in the, the, the guise of identity. Of Yeah, social and material hierarchy, hierarchies of labor are social hierarchies. And those unequal relations, if you have an unequal relation, you know, you, you have to organize on the basis of that inequality, which means that you cannot imagine a program of unity. Unity often means that those with more power are the ones who impose their program. This has been the history, the mm -hmm. history of so many organizations, male-dominated organizations, white-dominated organizations, that those who have more power are the ones who are capable of imposing their program and their concerns and their needs. I mean, the women's movement came out of the fact, you know, that uh, in the organization where women, you know, uh, were active, they could never, never actually put forward you know, their demands, put forward their concern, speak about their own, you know, oppression or exploitation. So women, in fact, began to create autonomous spaces precisely. And I think that the great explosion of struggle and creativity that the women's movement has represented, with all the limit and all the weight has been co-opted, etc., etc., but what the women's movement had, would never have been possible if women had remained within a, a mixed organization. It would never have been possible. It would never have been possible, for example, to speak of sexuality, to have the kind of analysis of sexuality which has been very important also for the LGBT movement. You know, uh, within, uh, can you imagine a whole discussion of women examining their sexuality you know, in a mixed organization? That would have been inconceivable, mm -hmm. inconceivable. And so a whole terrain of exploitation Right? would have been completely invisible, would have remained invisibilized, invisible, which means that that exploitation would have continued, would have been perpetuated, because if it is not visible, then uh, you, know, you, you, you continue to perpetuate it. So it's, it's extremely important that they, uh, to have autonomous space, and I think it's still important to have autonomous space, as long as you have an equal relations. Because otherwise you cannot articulate what is your life, your experience, your exploitation, your need, and your struggle, the forms of your struggle. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, the w the yeah. way the conversation has just gone has been reminding me about a lot of what was behind our thinking when we were kind of organizing. It was, was just thinking like, you know, in the, in the light of what's been like a several day sort of discussion around collectivity, um, I guess where we were on some level coming from was thinking about like what are the obstacles to collectivity in many ways, or not just obstacles, like how does one think around it in a situation where it's not, you know, it's not a straightforward proposition when one says collectivity. At this at this present moment, and so yeah, I'm. I mean, just to say, I think that uh, both of you have just been going in exactly that direction, saying that in some way. Uh, are there more anything? Which is um, so these the witch trials since the production of gender all of this, right? I was on a panel with you in 2011. Mm -hmm. um, my thinking here, or what concerns me, or the reason I bring it up, is that the apparatuses that are used or that are dealt with for dealing with violence are so different than those that are involved with when you talk about labor. And so I think, in a way, it's advantageous to um, talk about how and when one is the other, you know, and why one is the other. That, that was, and I, I guess, because, because there are different um, approaches, different sort of legal strategies, different social strategies for taking those forms of violence and separating them from each other. And so when you talk about like what kinds of trauma takes place in particular spaces, 
or in, in the arts especially, which are, as you pointed out, totally kind of um, exceptionalized in a certain way or taken out of history, that, that, that I'm a musician, musicians are seen as prehistoric in terms of labor, um, that, 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 in, that there are these different strategies for dismantling this kind of space that you're talking about as a kind of collection of, you know, as an accumulation of all these different forms of colonial violence, which are all obviously strategies that stem from the same kind of thing. So I just, I just felt like I needed to clarify that because you, that question of different approaches, I think, has an effect on how it's possible to organize. Are there yeah, the struggle against prison is a struggle that has to do with labor. The struggle against mass incarceration is a struggle that has to do with the massive devaluation of labor, right, for instance. I mean, I think it's our task to bring out those connections because they appear as separate realms, but actually they are very connected. There's a question there. This question kind of... My question kind of spins around um, a lot of stuff we've already been discussing, uh, so I apologize if it's redundant, but, um, you know, so um, the question, I mean, the connection between, I see the connection between wage and wages for housework. So they share the strategy of denaturalizing uh, types of labor that we might typically think of as unalienated or as a labor of love, um, art and, um, and, and domestic work, um, uh, respectively. Um, um, but uh, Sean, you know, pointed to examples where uh, we're actually rejecting the wage, a sort of productive volunteerism, where wageless work can actually be a liberatory thing. So I guess my question is, how does one differentiate between voluntary labor that is self-exploiting or uh, serving capital, and then voluntary labor that is in some way creating an emancipatory space um, that, is, that, is, that is useful? Um, and that's a question for, I guess, everyone on the panel. Well, I'll just respond directly and say that if the voluntary labor is in a space where some are getting paid for the same labor, then that's exploitative. And, and using spaces of voluntary labor um, only work if the group of people who are doing it are doing it with sort of a collective understanding that the way that money moves in the space is not replicating the way that money moves in society and the society's, um, the way that labor uh, is, is, so Sylvia has in her uh, say, um, Wages Against Work, a section titled labor, A Labor of Love. So there's lots of information in there if you, want to go into that conversation, and Sylvia could do obviously better than I could, but that, um, the, that the reason why I used CLAGS in the beginning of the talk was to acknowledge that once uh, money is pushed into spaces where the, the common denominator is a collective, uh, stable collective identity, then it shifts dramatically depending on who's in those positions, right? And so then it becomes a position that is destabilizing and the organization shifts and the work can't continue. So there's ways in which the, the identifying group, if the group is organizing based on an identity, which it, di it is based on um, uh, political identities in this form, in this uh, regard, then money should not actually be a part of it um, because it really is just contradicts the mission of the organization. Mm. Um, I think this question about waged, uh, sorry, unwaged work, the good, the bad, is actually um, at, this, at the center of at least what I've been working on or in some way. Um, you know, like what, what one defines as work, if it wasn't, in, wasn't work in capitalism, would maybe be a very different thing. Like there are a lot of forms of activity um, that are, are, you know, maybe one wouldn't necessarily conceptualize them as only work or um, as, uh, as kind of like only certain people's kind of work, like as as women's work used to be defined in, in some ways, or, and still is defined in, ma in many ways. Um, so uh, I suppose, um, 
I suppose it's like something that's lurking in, in our whole discussion at the moment, which is this discussion of value um, and how it, it has kind of captured work, obviously, from, from the get-go within capitalism, but also just like, um, I think for one to actually ask that question, um, one has to really take on kind of like quite fully, in a very full way, like what are the limits to the good types of work when they're happening in a context um, that is, is not, well, in my mind, able to be, um, to fully realize the potential of collectivity and when collectivity is, does become something palpable, it is often for capital, it is often um, in some way, uh, you know, m mobilized in, in various ways, more intricately, more subtly, um, to be able to kind of perpetuate um, systems of exploitation, et cetera. Can I add one oh. more thing? I'm so sorry. Yeah. I didn't say it, and I realized it's important to mention is that it's really also about agency and autonomy. So it goes back to the assumption that if it's a volunteer space, and if it's a collective space, then it's, it's back to that concept of consent and consensus, which is the people who are in the room are potentially, in no other instance, able to decide for themselves the work that they do, right? So this space now says, if, if one enters a collective space, this, it is by design set up in contrast to societal um, forms where they're told what to do, you know, this is, you have to put this on the shelf and that's the only, di only place where it can go. Whereas in these volunteer specific spaces, anyone, regardless of whether you walk in once or you've been there for 10 years, you have complete uh, agency to do what you wanna do in the space for the pur better purpose of the space or the greater purpose of the space. And that changes um, the landscape of what anything can look like when women of color, for example, enter a space and have complete autonomy, or young people or people without money can enter a space and have complete autonomy. So it's not an internship, right, where someone's like, you can do this work, but get me coffee. It's really literally walk in and put on a production, right, and do what you need to do and run the show. And if you are interested, then you can get it done. So I think that that is what makes it um, non-exploitative. Yeah, sorry, this is probably just going backwards a little bit, but I just want to clarify that um, Wage does not advocate that artists should get paid for the work of being artists. It's really specifically defined as, um, it's, a, it's not at all about wage labor, it's about demanding artist fees, which are very different than wage labor, um, than wages. Um, and uh, the demand is for getting paid when you enter into a transactional relationship with an arts organization. So it's for the work that you do once you enter into that relation. Um, so that's a kind of way around this problem of can, is it possible to compensate artists for the work of making art, which is, I believe, kind of a fool's errand to try to do that. It's a kind of um, quantitative impossibility. Um, so it's still a, a way of making a, a demand, but a very specific one around a very specific kind of relation. Lise, could you maybe say a bit about individual certification? Because I think that's really interesting in terms of this shift uh, in relation to ideas of value and access and how those are controlled in a way. Yeah, we're um, in the sort of, sort of early stages, maybe middle stages of developing a kind of extension of wage certification which certifies those arts organizations that pay fees meeting minimum payment standards that have been established by wage and artist space is a wage certified organization which means that we're all getting paid fees according to um, uh, uh, standards that are calibrated against artist space's total annual operating budget. So the principle is that the higher the budget of the organization, the higher the fee. That's just the kind of nutshell summary. Um, but so we're also thinking right now about trying to certify individual artists. Um, and they'd be certified on the basis of their commitment to only engage their labor um, according to, as long as the organization is paying fees according to wage standards. So that organization, an organization wouldn't have to be certified, but they'd have to pay fees as though they were. So it's a way of trying to pressure organizations to get certified, but it's a way of organizing artists. It's sort of a way of building a union, but through a kind of boycott mechanism. 
Um, so it's a kind of, it's a, I mean, it's, it's sort of a, it's intended as a kind of solidarity building um, project, but on the other hand, because artists are so, such atomized workers and also so in competition with one another, which is one of the biggest challenges to organizing within the arts, it's sort of really in opposition to, in a way, some of what you're advocating in terms of commons, but um, I mean, yeah, sadly, the art world is not a very commons friendly um, place or field. Um, but that's what that's what we're thinking about right now. Um, well, I mean, in some ways, you can say the art world relies on a commons. It's just an unacknowledged and non-politicized commons. Yeah. I mean, that's the kind of commons of free labor, resources, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also commons of cooperation. Yeah. And to an extent, that gets politicizes maybe through struggles around compensation, for example. Yeah, and it's actually interesting if you sort of thinking about this, I mean, this is really off the top of my head, but I think there is a kind of weird separatism amongst artists in relation to other people within the arts, like administrators, curators, as a kind of, a sort of weirdly secret society mm -hmm. that kind of um, develops and that, but it actually itself generates value. I think a lot of the interest, I mean, this is totally speculative on my part, but I feel like some of the interest that collectors have in um, buying art um, that some maybe curators, I don't know, museum directors, whoever, have in engaging with art is this kind of, um, is wanting access to this kind of, this value that's generated from it being this somehow sort of separatist or somehow, um, the, the, the value, yeah, the value is sort of, it's, it's very uh, opaque, you know, and very, and very fl like uh, fluid or something like that. And, I'm going to tweet, separatism generates value. <laughs> yeah, I think it, but I think it does. I don't know, but the, the way does. you're describing that kind of value in the art world is, is actually, like, that, that's, that's elitism in many ways, what you're describing, if I got oh. you right. So, um, so yeah, well, flip side, of flip the coin, I suppose. Um, yeah, but ironically, it's elitism, but I feel like it's also um, the kind of underlying commonality or the, the kind of camaraderie that happens is actually this kind of like anti-capitalist um, impulse or something. It's like that we're bound together by our, by our misery um, and, <laughs> and our, um, I don't know, I think there's also sort of this unspoken uh, rule in the art world that we're all sort of supposedly, you know, working in service of, of a critique of capitalism, of the system within which we're operating. Um, and that's sort of where this, this sort of seek this, the cells within that are kind of. Um... I mean, it's hard. It's hard not to uh, say we should end on the point that we're bound by misery. But um, <laughs> are are there um, further sort of observations, reflections, comments, questions? Thanks. Um, I just wanted to ask about this question of, um, and not to, because I'm a big supporter of wage and understand the historical significance of wages for housework and not to diminish either of those things or at any of the projects that you're um, bringing up this evening, but I just had a question about kind of essentializing factors and maybe some of the implications of um, what we talk about when we refer to wages for housework, for example, and the idea that the sort of resting presumption that, um, that housework isn't a shared field between all members of a household um, and that kind of diverts the attention away from that possibility and into this monetized, um, like a more, a more monetized understanding of labor, I guess, and effective labor. Um, and I guess I just was wondering if I'm the only person whose <laughs> mind goes there um, to that question. And then similarly, with wage, this idea that we, we're, all, we're maybe reinforcing an, a certain notion of what, it, what constitutes the subject of an artist and um, how an artist is kind of meant to, to properly uh, engage the system and, and cooperate with the system in a sort of coercive, maybe a, a 
a kind of coercive way. Um, that's sort of a long, I don't know, I hope that made sense, but I was just wondering if anyone wanted to speak to some of, some of the dangers, and I would, I would call them dangers, but that's, that might be just, you know, we can argue with that, but um, sort of how people handle that, those questions. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call wage coercive because it's all based on uh, mechanisms of self-regulation. I mean, sure, there's some shaming that goes on, but, you know, <laughs> that's just to jumpstart the process. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if it's coercive, and I also just think we're trying to establish very basic minimum standards where there are none. Um, and again, they're voluntary, you know? I mean, I suppose the idea of individual certification is to kind of, is to put pressure on organizations to adopt these minimum standards, but I mean, it just makes no sense to me that there's no minimum wage, you know? This is like one of the only, se I mean, it's not one of the only sectors, but it's unique in that way, and it just makes absolutely no sense. And I don't, um, as I said before, it's not, we're not advocating that every aspect of artistic practice be monetized. We're pointing to very, very specific instances in which um, these relationships between institutions and artists can be defined in terms of a labor relation. And uh, it's not totalizing. Um, I mean, it is if you want it to be. I think it could be taken in that direction, but it also can be taken in the other direction, which is maybe um, this kind of for and against tension that we're talking about in relation to wages for housework. I wonder why there's so much suspicion about the wage when the, the, the same argument that are presented against wages for housework, for example, they will never be presented for wages for teaching, wages. Why don't we have a movement where we propose that everybody gives up wages so that we actually deinstitutionalize the <laughs> wage system? Okay, well, yeah. are you all ready to give up your wages? Okay, right now? <laughs> so that we actually have a more genuine type of life? <laughs> now, yes. because Watch this is what happen. I hear, you see. Uh, see, so everybody feels like, oh, about housework, wages for housework. Oh, is this such a pure kind of work or work that should be shared? But that same argument is never made. No, but I'm just about saying. other type of wages. Now, the question is, women have tried, for example, to have other members of the family to share the housework. And we have not been very successful because, in fact, <laughs> I mean, women still do. <laughs> I just, I, you know, I'll finish this and then you can respond to me. But we have not been very successful, and I think it's important to see why we have not been successful. But there's another issue which is more important, I think, and I think perhaps that's the crux of the matter. You know, the issue is what kind of work this is. You know, what kind of work? If this was self-directed activity, activity that we do in the process of our self-realization, et cetera, et cetera, if it was indeed a labor of love, I think that there would be really a serious question about the demanding wages for it. But, you know, I think that the, the issue is, if indeed this is work, that in fact we do not do in conditions of self-determination, but is work that has been constructed in particular ways that have been extremely painful for the life of women, and not only women, and have been particularly uh, instrumental to our impoverishment, to our dependence, you know, to, to the, the loss of uh, many of uh, our social creativity and so forth. If that is the case, and if it is the case, that so much money has been accumulated out of this labor, that in fact we have given capitalism our life, our work for generations, and with that, for example, they've built nuclear submarines. If that is the case, then why should we be so concerned about demanding because that's what Wages for Housing is about, a reappropriation, you know, a reappropriation of, of, of wealth that we have created, a reappropriation so that, in fact, we take away from capitalism what they've stolen from us, the life that they've stolen from us. Obviously, 
If wages for house was the end, you know, if we are put on our flags that wages for house or equal revolution, probably that would be because wage labor we know is not the end of capitalism. But what we always saw, we saw it as a way of changing power relation in a significant way, mm -hmm. of changing power relation and not saying to the capital, oh, please give us another job. What has happened? That in fact, now women work 24 hours a day and they work unpaid in the home, low paid outside the world. Seventy percent of jobs the women have gotten are jobs that are retail work, underpaid, very as monotonous as uh, wages for how a housework can be in the home, right? Certainly nothing about the creativity they work outside. So I think it's very important to really try to understand what is that we're talking, what we're talking. If we don't agree, of course, that this is work, that is creating wealth for the capitalist, then, then it's another discourse, right? But if you think that this, in fact, is a continuous uh, flow of energies, flow of lives, flow of labor, right, that goes into the accumulation of this very unjust system that actually contributes to build the power of one of the most unjust systems in, in the history of humanity, then I think demanding something back. And you know, I would even say that even in the case of self-directed activity, right, the problem that we confront with that self-directed activity is that we don't have in our hands the wealth, that the state has monopolized most of the wealth. You know, this summer I was visiting communities in Argentina, you know, where you know, women were really building everything with their hands, you know, with the really objective of, of autonomy, of not wanting the state. But they had to fight with the states to get something, to get material to build the roads, or to get some food for the public kitchens, for the comedores populares. They had to because they had nothing. <laughs> the problem is they have taken away wealth from us. So how do we take it back? Right? We say, oh no, we don't Re want Repatriation, money. and I mean, I completely... Sorry, I'll stop here. The historical... No, I, I just, I appreciate everything you're saying about this historical situation, and I, I was only trying to bring to light the notion that to say you demand wages for housework is to say you demand housework, and you don't demand the distribution of housework, perhaps. Um, that's, that's, but of course, I'm, I'm, when I say that, I'm, I'm also naively, you know, oversimplifying a, 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 an enormous uh, historical situation. But that's, that was, that's only what I'm, you know, in any case. There's a great interview of Sylvia. Sorry, I hope you don't mind that I'm doing this. Witch Tales, an interview with Sylvia Federici, and it's on viewpointmag.com, you can just Google it, where she asks the question for the wage and against the wage. And I think she contextualizes it um, in the form of historicizing it. Perhaps you would understand the connection to slavery and the development of an entire nation um, from work that was not paid, right? So that maybe will help you to connect it to a conceptual understanding of, of wage and not wage. Yeah, what we have told the slaves, you shouldn't take, you shouldn't struggle to become a free laborer, free in the sense of a wage laborer, because otherwise, you know, we know the wages are institutionalizing, et cetera, et cetera, are still within the realm of capitalist relation. Or we would have thought that perhaps that represented a level of more power with which to struggle. Not the end, perhaps another form of slavery. People have spoken about wage slavery, but with certainly more social power to struggle. Yeah. I don't know, I think it's an interesting point, and I feel like when I first read Sylvia's book, it was this kind of switch in kind of understanding of value systems in a way. And I think just to raise very, very quickly at the end, I thought 
I wanted to ask her about what Nina Power was talking about at the end of the last We Not I, and that I invited Nina Power to give a talk. I had seen her in conversation with Fulvia from um, Claire Fontaine, um, actually about your writing and Carla Lonzi as well. And then at one point, Nina Power just said, ah, oh, I think we should take up arms um, for empathy. Oh. Empathy. Like she was kind of saying that this idea that like we, um, um, this idea of radical empathy, that maybe actually we should try to fight to protect <laughs> empathy as a subject matter. And like this idea that rather this, I thought was interesting about it was this switch or this idea that if we kind of stop thinking about, um, if we start thinking about care, and not care work, but care as something that's valued above profit, I don't know, a very, but I mean, I think that wages for housework, for me, again, that it's that radical shift of perception that's important. But that, that's, that, isn't that kind of this, I just feel like the shift in talking about, from domestic work to talking about care is kind of a dangerous one also because it places care in that kind of realm of, of the labor of love and makes it um, more vulnerable to a kind of devaluation. Um, so I'm sort of surprised that that was used, that was a strategic shift. No, I, th as it I, seems. I think what probably what Nina was implying and what Melissa was referring to was more kind of like we have to actually like become militant about our care and our networks of relationships. We have to politicize them so they're not just kind of turned into resources in the way you're suggesting. Yeah, that was sort of referring back to the yeah. earlier conversation, yeah. but yeah. Maybe this is a good place to draw it to a close. Um, I'm just going to make a quick announcement. We have vodka. Uh, so if, you're, if you feel... If the energy is there to stick around and have a drink, then please do stay and drink vodka with us. Uh, thank you very much to tonight's panelists. It was amazing.